All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really glad to see the CD Council here and um, all of us who are so into this space. Um, I'm Emily Freeman, and I'm like the new chair, which is kind of weird to say because we all miss Michael, and he was so great with everything that he's done. So I'm I'm really happy that I'm able to help out and just kind of um, lead us forward as as we go. So um, I just wanted to uh, let you know I. I love Michael the way Michael started off meetings, but today's agenda was super packed. So doing our like one question and get to know you just kind of didn't really fit today. So I apologize for that. I really hope we can bring that back in November because I think it really builds a great rapport among everyone and um, lets us get to know each other on a personal level. So I um, apologize that that's not part of today's meeting, but I, um, I think that we have a really great lineup. So um, I just want to kind of let you know what today's uh, overall um, kind of agenda is that we are going to hear from Urban Machine. I think some of you guys have had a quick introduction to them. Um, and they are, in, a, in short, they have a solution to help denail um, lumber and help prepare it for reuse and markets. Um, there was a really great presentation done by the Colorado Stead Company. They're out of, and they presented to the Northern Colorado Council. Um, this maybe was it about a week and a half ago, and they they remanufacture wood uh, into new studs but those wood studs need to be free from all metal and be ready for use. So I think there are different ways that we can kind of look at how we are capturing wood, preparing it. And I think there's some interesting space around that. Um, Lori has uh, had a quick intro to Urban Machine and all the work that they're doing with uh, Circular Colorado. We'll, we'll probably be considering like just continuing conversations and figuring things out. But I was hoping today would be an introduction to our c and Council um, so you can understand what Urban Machine is doing um, and see if this might be a solution that we want to explore in Colorado. So um, after that, we are going to shift gears a little bit and have Lori and Eric present on Circular Colorado and the outreach sessions that they're going to be conducting. Um, then we're gonna kind of revisit our policy toolkit and see where we want to go from there, how we can share that out, um, talking about uh, snack and share. And then I just wanted to, that'll be anything remaining will be time for uh, updates on what we're doing um, in the work that we have. So. Are we all good? Good plan? All right. Okay. Well, I'm going to um, shift this over to Eric and to Ashley with Urban Machine. And uh, pretty sure they've got some slides and we can go from there. Awesome. At least we videos. Do, we, we do have video. We're, we're going to skip on the slides today. We've got a cool video for you guys that we're going to share, which is always better than slides. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm Eric Law, and Ashley is with me here. Uh, we are Urban Machine. Uh, we are a two-year-old robotics company uh, based in Oakland, California, and we are building robots for removing metal fasteners from wood. And what I'll do is I'll share my screen here with you guys, um, and so you can see what we're up to. Can you guys see that okay, Emily? Yes, I see it. Okay, perfect. Cool. And so what we've got is robotics for removing the nails, screws, and staples from the wood. Uh, we still use humans for removing the large fasteners, things like MEP pipe hangers, electrical boxes, stuff like that. Uh, but those are low in volume compared to nails, staples, and screws. And then we use robotics for the high volume, highly repetitive fasteners. 
Um, so we're using computer vision, we've got gantry cranes here, we've got brushes to remove some light surface contaminants. And right now we're focused on clean wood. So we're not doing any painted wood or any hazardous treated wood. Uh, we're focused on clean dimensional lumber uh, that's just full of metal. Uh, and our scope of work is to get that wood metal free. Uh, so once it's metal free, then folks like the Snow Farm can convert it into material. Other wood manufacturers can process it. Uh, because when the metal's out, then you can plane it, you can figure join it, and you can turn it into lots of different materials. Uh, and so that's our goal here at Urban Machine is to create metal-free reclaimed wood using robotics. Uh, this machine that I just showed in the video here, this is our fourth iteration on the technology. Um, it's currently going through field trials um, outside, so it runs full-time now, 40 hours a week, with a two-person crew on it, uh, constantly feeding it material every day. Um, and our engineers are learning a lot about what components are doing good, which ones aren't, in that dusty, dirty uh, lumber yard that we're operating at. And then we've got a fifth iteration that'll be coming out in October. They'll be starting a pilot project at a, uh, at a waste recovery facility here in the San Francisco Bay Area. So far to date, most of our materials come from demolition contractors and deconstruction contractors. And then we're starting to move kind of downstream into the material recovery facilities. So a little lower quality material than what we get directly off the job sites, but still a large volume of two by fours and two by six. Uh, the machine will process everything from a two by four to a six by 18 on the cross section side. And then right now this version will do six feet on up to 40 feet. The next iteration will go and do four feet on so we can do small to large there um, on that. Um, our plans are for the system is to really finish up R&D this year and then start a small production run next year. Our goal is to build 12 systems uh, by the end of the year and get those deployed out to about six different metropolitan areas. Um, so Emily's been a huge evangelist of trying to get the, one or two of these into the Boulder metropolitan area. Um, and so what we're looking for in those pilot projects um, is, you know, obviously government incentives that support deconstruction and reuse of materials. Uh, waste streams, so who can provide the raw material? And then on the wood products, who can consume large volumes of wood? So is it lumber yards, wood manufacturing companies? Who can put this material back into use at the volume that's going to be coming through this machine and through those sources? Um, and so that's what Ashley and the team on our sales team is working on, is identifying those areas for next year of where we're going to roll out these machines. Uh, we're hoping to get the first one of those batch probably into Q2. Uh, I should start to ship out of here from our offices uh, to the first job sites or first metropolitan areas uh, next year. And then that does it by the end of the year in six different regions. Let's see. I I don't think so. No? No? Cool. I think that was so good. It's pretty straightforward. We're getting the metal out of wood so it can be reused. Uh, we're a team of 13 people here in Oakland. Uh, and then we've got one in Chicago as well uh, that are working on this problem, mostly mechanical and software engineers. Uh, some of the specs on the machine is it's designed to remove or clean 10 to 20,000 board feet per day. Uh, and that really depends on the material. If you're running a lot of two by fours, you're gonna be more closer to 10,000 board feet a day because two by fours have the highest number of fasteners per board foot. Um, if you're running larger cross sections, you got your four by four, four by eight, four by twelves. Those have fewer fasteners per board foot. So then you can hit your 20,000 a day with those systems or with that uh, raw material. Uh, with that, we'll feel free to open up to questions Feel free to fire away. So, um, Eric, can you tell the, the team here a little bit more? I, I know it's currently, it's operational outside. Can you tell them a little bit more about, um, like, you know, what the, how, like, housing needs, how big the machine is? Like, I know you've mentioned that it's movable. Um, just kind of a little bit more about those pieces. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it takes up about a 3,000 square foot footprint. Um, so that includes inventory, infeed, um, access for trucks to it um, is about what it takes. It's about a 90 foot long process line. It's about 10 feet wide for the process line itself with all the components uh, working together. Um, typically, the system we call it semi-portable. Um, it travels on 40 foot flatbed trailers. 
So it can be picked up off those trailers and set up to run at either, think about like a large job site, if you're taking down, you know, 50,000 square foot, 100,000 square foot old warehouse, it's got wood truss roofs. That would be a good one. Um, or it can operate at a central collection point, you know, where all your residential contractors, your small commercial contractors are all dumping their trucks and trailers um, on those. Um, the closer we get to the source, the higher the quality of the material, uh, especially if it's a deconstructed project. But we know there's still a lot of waste that's going to end up coming from small jobs uh, into the waste facilities. So we're looking at those as uh, source points for operating the machine. Uh, the machine is designed to run outside. We know not everybody has warehouse space available for the machine. Um, and so we can run it outside or inside uh, for this particular system. And you've also said it doesn't have to be 90 feet long straight. It can be like in sections. Um, or do you it, need it to be like 90 feet? It does have to be 90 feet straight. straight okay. Yeah, to fit within 3,000 square feet, we do have to be 90 feet straight okay. for it to operate. We can change the layout a little bit, um, but that will increase the footprint. So if you don't have 100 by 30, essentially, um, you can go wider, but you then start to go more to four or 5,000 square feet just because wood runs linearly very well. Right. It doesn't transition sideways quite It doesn't like to bend? It doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just I wanted to just quickly add for everyone's benefit too. Like Jonathan is in the city of Lakewood, and they have um, a deconstruction ordinance, and coupled with boulders as well. And I believe we have some. Um, uh, I think we have the new person on. Alex, are you you're from Larimer County? Are you with Fort City of Fort Collins or just Larimer County? County. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, I'm with Larimer County. Um, I'm the project manager for a new landfill that we're building in Transfer Station. So. Okay, awesome. Um, so we, I know for City of Fort Collins has a deconstruction ordinance as well, and I, Denver's coming online as well. And so I think for, for us, we're just looking at um, different ways that we can help develop markets. And one of the, one of the um, major products coming out of uh, buildings being deconstructed are those wood components. And it's like, what do we do with them right now? We're primarily taking them and they're getting mulched uh, and turned into animal velvet and sorry, animal bedding. And so when we're looking at like, how do we like try and keep that highest and best order of use, being able to find solutions that will get the denailing process complete um, because that's what Re uh, Resource Central and several other places are looking for is those denailed nut lumber and nobody wants to sit there like really denailing every single piece of lumber coming out that this would help automate that as well. Um, do you, Eric, could you guys talk a little bit about the like kind of the leasing model and what you are are kind of expecting as well. Just so with this. Yeah, so we won't be selling the hardware uh, at least for the next couple of years because we know there's going to be more iterations of it. Um, so our goal next year is to work with our partners either on a leasing, a typical leasing model um, where the partner wants to lease and operate it, we can do that. Um, or on more of a subscription model, you know, hardware as a service. Uh, where the cost of the machine is based on the board footage. So it's more of a unit price per board foot that you run through the machine. Um, so both of those are still being worked out. You know, we're still young early company, so we do have some good flexibility work with our clients um, and find a solution that works for both of us. And so but the main goal is to get the equipment out in the hands of customers next year. Um, those early pilot metropolitan areas and get material flowing through it um, as we work towards mass production in 2025. Anna. Hey, um, thanks for your guys' presentation. I know it, the, when I'd spoken to you earlier this year, you'd mentioned the city of Austin or maybe San Antonio or and King County area were applying for EPA um, grants to purchase the equipment, but so it sounds like they would be renting the equipment or do you know how they 
structured those grant applications? Yeah, they'd be rented. They would provide them with rental rates. Okay. And are you, do you know what their overall timeline is when they'll find out if they get it and how that will work? Yeah, I know they submitted it this spring. Uh, it was like March or April. They submitted yeah. those grant applications, uh, but they have not heard back yet. Um, so we're all waiting to hear. Um, I think they said it's supposed to be sometime this fall. Uh, is when they're supposed to hear um, if they receive grant funding or not through those EPA grants. Okay, and um, there's a couple of state grants in Colorado that we could apply for. Um, to help purchase some type of equipment, but most of the grants here don't allow for renting the equipment unless something um, changes. So it might be something to keep in mind just as you guys are, I'm sure, trying to hurry the process of having equipment ready to sell, um, but that would be a factor from Colorado standpoint. Yeah, we'll have to take a look at the constraints and what it allows and doesn't allow. Uh and work with you guys on that. The main reason why we don't want to sell the equipment is because we don't want to have outdated equipment out there where somebody like is using it and a year later there's a new version that comes out that's way more productive and way more accurate. And they're like, hey, I just bought this. It's already out of date. Uh, that's the big challenge is with working with startups is our equipment gets updated pretty quickly. Um, and then we don't want to support something that's out of date for you know five, 10 years to the capital equipment life cycle. Uh, we have a new version. Uh, but we can take a look at that legislation and, and see what it does cover, um, because it may cover for something like consulting costs, and we may be able to do something like that. So we'll have to look at what the constraints are and see how we can work together on that, because we would hate for you guys to end up with a piece of outdated equipment uh, in your facility if you guys choose to operate it. Right. Yeah, there could be a creative way to problem solve that. Yep. Anyone have any other questions? Um, sure, this is Liz Chapman. I'm the executive director of Recycle Colorado. I'm curious what your end market is as it stands right now. Yeah, so we've been spending a lot of time with architects and furniture designers and they have the specified reclaimed lumber uh, really for a lot of architectural applications, which works out really well with your older aged wood really kind of about 60 year and older material where you've got the tight grain, the darker wood material, the really high quality stuff. The architects love that. Um, then we're also working with a partner on some mass timber products, um, down laminated timber for that younger material, where it's got really good structural properties to it, but it just doesn't have that same old age look that architects look for when they're doing you know, wall cladding and siding products. Um, and so we're gonna be spinning up a pilot project with one of our partners here in December to produce um, Dowel laminated timber panels using reclaimed lumber. Um, and so that's a partnership with us, uh, Albay Mellon Lumber Company in American Canyon, and, and then uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, we're working with their uh, forest products research group as well. On that. And is there a cost savings for your customers as opposed to buying non reclaimed? So our goal is to compete with virgin lumber uh, and on parity with it. So it would be the same price. The big advantage with our lumber over, say, lumber bought from a mill is you don't have to train or truck it, you know, 1,000, 2,000 miles, depending on where you are. Um, so there's definitely some logistical savings costs. And the other advantage is if you're into sustainability, you know, our carbon footprint is a fraction of virgin lumber. Um, the other thing that's great, too, about reclaimed lumber is our quality is much better. Um, older trees have tighter grains, much higher quality than what you get today. So you get a much higher quality product. Uh, the one downside to reclaim it is a little bit harder than virgin. So just keep that in mind if you're trying to hand pound small nails into it. It's a little more difficult. But if you're using screws and drills and tools like that, finger joiners and planers, it works just fine. For Doug for, for your few traditional soft woods. Um, luckily for those of us in the western part of the US, we don't have the issue like the Northeast where they use a lot of hardwoods. Um, 
thought of another question for you. Do you, does your equipment sort through lumber that has cracks in it or do the two people that are managing the equipment sort that through? First, that's the first question. Second question is, are you guys having any issue with damaging the lumber as you remove uh, fasteners and nails, screws, et cetera? Yeah, um, so the first one right now we're relying on human inspection for major cracks down the middle to separate and pick which pieces get claimed. So, you know, if it's a two by six with a big crack running down the center of it, it's not going to make two two by fours out of it. Um, so those don't get claimed. Um, we are going to be, well, we're currently researching technology to look at grading it for structural reuse. Um, so it could come out with a grade stamp on it. Uh, we're still early on in that. The, we're also looking at can we grade it using computer vision with our cameras to give it like an outside appearance grade to help with that sorting process as well. Um, as far as damaging the wood when we're cleaning it, um, right now the one place where we see kind of catastrophic damage is if a piece is uh, partially into our machine, we're picking off the end of it, uh, sometimes it does fracture. Uh, once it's completely in, we can clamp on both sides of it that we don't have any issues with any catastrophic. Um, when we are digging out the fasteners, we do leave small indentations of the wood. We do dig around that nail to get under the head or the screw to get down in it. So you will see, you know, maybe up to a half inch long uh, divot in the wood, we'll call it. Um, but that is for recessed fasteners. If the fasteners are exposed, then it's just a nail body because all you've got a hole from where that nail body was. Okay. Thank you. Anna is one of uh, like our first lumber like resale, uh, major like resale um, companies, if you will. Like you do deconstruction, but you also have a lumber resale warehouse um, out of the Denver area as well. So uh, while we She's not just like sourcing it, but she also is able to help sell it. So there's like Resource Central um, in Boulder, but they, they want the, the denailed stuff. And then Anna, are you guys hand denailing or are you selling, selling like already nailed lumber? Like what does that kind of market look like for you? And Yeah, we're mostly denailing it and trimming it at our warehouse. It helps keep our crew busy when we have a schedule uh, delay and um, I would say 80% is denailed. And then um, we often we have a lot of neighbors, people walking by job sites that are, are curious or homeowners that want to reuse the material. And so we'll leave maybe 20% back with nails or people and we'll give it to free uh, or very low cost and denail it themselves. Um, not to go into too big of a rabbit hole, but I did want to mention to this group that I did just have a, a friend um, build a permitted ADU in Denver with reclaimed lumber. And the city of Denver building inspector approved the lumber that my friend bought from our warehouse, and it didn't need to be regraded. Um, so what I learned from this process is that um, be basically it comes down to your individual building inspector <laughs> um, but i i had spent a lot of time researching and trying to get somebody to regrade lumber um, and i do have the contact to do that i just never found a contractor willing to pay to regrade it but that's all to say maybe you don't have to if you have a building inspector at least for the denver area i haven't done that in boulder county yet or larimer yeah, that's probably the same thing you're going to find across most of the U.S., except for Oregon and Washington, uh, where in their building code, you can reuse, uh, I guess, a number two by default, any dimensional number. That's already come out of a building that's a number two. Um, but yeah, we have found some graders that will come out and regrade packages of lumber, uh, and they'll issue a certificate with it. They won't actually stamp it. They'll give you a cert to go with that package of lumber that you can show your building official during it. But uh, yeah, that risk of coming down to which individual you get is, <laughs> no, that's a hard one. <laughs> but it's great to know that they're out there, that they're accepting it. It's a good start. And I know with the Colorado Stead Company, they are uh, actually being able to put stamps on that. So they're taking, I think, 12 to 18 inch pieces of uh, cuttings from lumber. This is all has been from uh, new builds. 
um, that's where they've been sourcing their lumber because it doesn't already have nails in it. Um, but they are able to get the structural uh, grading stamped on. Um, but it's probably because the wood hadn't been technically used, even though it is finger jointed together and glued back for for use. So I don't know, kind of <laughs> I'm sort of high that. in the sky is like, well, wouldn't that be great to be able to run run some lines through with deconstructed lumber as well? But who knows? Yeah. I'm not sure if that fits anyone's model or transportation and trucking all work, but um I, I was curious, Jonathan, if you're around um, with Lakewood's ordinance, are are you seeing a need for markets for wood, like structural wood? I don't think I can answer that at this point. We actually don't have a deconstruction ordinance. We have a recycling requirement on construction and demolition, um, and that includes untreated wood, um, but I'm not you know, we, we have ordinance in place. Uh, we don't have full enforcement going on yet, so I don't have a, you know, we're in the process of getting all that up and running. So I don't really have any okay. direct data, but I mean, I can't imagine that it would be anything but a positive to have, you know, uh, facilities and, you know, a market to for our contractors and folks working here to take their stuff to. So. That's one thing we struggled. I, I know our machines asked us like, do you know, do you have your date, like the data and wood has been kind of, sometimes we get the reporting and sometimes we don't um, for specific to wood. Um, and I think part of that is that we don't, we're, we've been doing it from a diversion percentage, not a source separation um, requirement at this point. And some contractors just don't, don't do wood and they, they still demo a house. Um, not Anna, but we're working on it. So. so sort sort of in the same boat as you, Jonathan. We don't quite have the data, but we're we're working we're working on it. So. But we have I know we have a lot of homes that come down. So all right. Does anyone else have any other questions? Right. Thank you very much for having us, Emily. Thank you so much, um, Eric and Ashley.